tam si já last year um, and met my friend Mike who we had seen in Finland two years ago and uh, just having a short chat with him helped uh, my wife find a job in Red Hat. So it was a very nice thing to see him again today okay. and yesterday. Cool. Yeah, I'm Mike, I'm from Germany, I work for Red Hat and this is my first time to the from from Bruneau and um, when I uh, went to the city the first day this time, I saw this new uh, horse which was nicknamed Virgie Up and I liked it a lot because I had heard the tourist guide last year talking about plans to erect this and but I was very surprised that it's actually there already. Mm -hmm. It looks so nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my name is Reed and uh, the best thing uh, this conference for me was that I gave a talk yesterday and uh, in the middle of the talk I started to talk about some topic and the guy from the author was like, hey, that was exactly my question. <laughs> so yeah, that's very good question. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely nailed it. <laughs> so that, that was the was, was Hi, I'm David and maybe the most interesting part for me so far was yesterday quest for, for finding my goal at the, at the room because it was like, oh, this, this, this is number five. Oh, we have this socket like this and it was a completely indifferent place. And it took like 15 minutes to find and 
It was better than some uh, So, hi, I'm Jakub. Uh, yesterday I also had a meeting with a friend. I met a friend that I didn't expect him to be here. Uh, that he worked uh, in the same company. And it's a good thing. The bad thing is uh, that yesterday my car was working just fine for me, and today it just sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, sad. All right. Thanks. Um, now I'd like to get us a, a little, get our brains working and get to know the names a little better. So if you could please all stand up, and we will be moving in the room. Uh, if you just please introduce to each other and uh, in a specific way, we will be exchanging our names. So in the in the beginning, I have my own name. I'm Peter. This is Hanka, and I'm going to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, I'm Hanka. Thank you. Now I am Hanka, and she is Peter. <laughs> okay? And we'll continue to someone else. And I say, hi, I'm Hanka, and I get another name. And we'll be exchanging names like that. And when, when you meet this, the two names that are the same, it means we made a mistake, so you just say, oh, we screwed up, and we'll start over. Okay? <laughs> so now everyone starts with their own name. So, hi, I'm... Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, I'm Hi, I'm Hi, I'm Chetak. Oh, I'm Hi. Oh, we screwed up again. I'm Chetak. Hi, I'm Peter. Okay. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, I'm Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, I'm David. Hi, I'm David. Hi, I'm David. Hi, I'm David. Are you still Hi, I'm David. 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 Hi, I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Hanka. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you? I'm David. Hi, I'm Mike. Yes, David. David. Hi, okay. Hi, I'm Hanka. I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. 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 I'm so, who's who now? Who is who now? Let's try, let's try to do the check. I think I'm Meet. Meet? Okay. Oh, yeah, no. I, 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 think I'm, I, mean, I think I'm Meet too. <laughs> 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 okay, that's what we're doing. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay. So, let's try one more time, just, just to get our brains work a little more. So, I'm, Pete, I'm better again, and let's go one, one yeah. more round. I, 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 Just, just uh, say who starts and uh, go for it. <laughs> Don't 
And don't let yourself be beaten, just run! Run from the boss and who's beating you! You know, I have a girlfriend and she's very beautiful. And yeah, uh, speaking of being beautiful, you know, I uh, was <laughs> hairdressers and. Yeah, speaking of hairdressers, you know, I think I need a haircut because my hair is really yeah, long. Yeah, speaking of haircut, I totally agree with you. Right? Speaking of agreeing, you know. Yeah, and so on. <laughs> I think you <laughs> got the idea. So uh, the task is to interrupt each other 
as um, many times as possible. Okay? So, let's start.
is Saturday. Mm -hmm. Okay, imagine it's Sunday and uh, I'm sitting the wrong way, but okay. Um, <laughs> our God is the uh, best thing in the world who gives us life, uh, who gives us uh, feelings, love, everything we have. So I ask you today, in this Sunday morning, to <laughs> To be grateful for what you have. <laughs> uh, if I had a security, I would kick you out. <laughs> uh, for the life we have, um, to be grateful for that and uh, think again about human being. Um, it's supposed to be longer, but I think it's quite enough to do. Okay, good. Uh, You choose of the two which one you like more. You will perform more. Well, we probably we, we, we won't get to both. <laughs> so, so, what shall we do? Or should we arrange? Yes. Uh, yeah, you can stay like you. Okay. okay. So, I can tell you, we spent some time together. Uh, and now I know that I, if I would have to go against you, I would be fucking terrified because you are the fucking best uh, and toughest group of guys uh, that I've ever uh, encountered. And I'm telling you, if we go out there today, we will kick their asses and they will go back home where they belong to. And we will not take, uh, uh, let them take our freedom or our land. Oh, well, it's supposed to be general before that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. just. Okay. I think that you can stay. So. Mm -hmm. to discuss uh, the, big the big proposal which can have a very big impact on our country and how our society will evolve and you know to reduce some crime, get a better education for people and to really make uh, lives in, in this country better. Uh, we know that we will need still some comments and amendments but I think that we are on a good way to we are really, really the greatest country in the world. <laughs> it was just politicians Politician. talking about government bill. Uh -huh. Nice. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, um, maybe David, you can comment right on here on the. <laughs> <laughs>
see that uh, this uh, one is supposed to be a symbol of foresight because. Actually, uh, what, what's this? What's this? This is uh, this part of oh, yes, yes. This is uh, uh, the church, uh, and you can see that the roof of the church is taken see it. off uh, because <laughs> the, um, if the roof is still there and splendid and it might might burn, if they uh, shoot some cans into the roof, and so the general defending the city was very. Uh, Careful and doing the best he could to uh, end off the streets, and in the end he was successful. <laughs> <laughs> Some city guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, is it time? Yeah, we have about five minutes, I think, before before we start another lecture. So please uh, make a couple of demands more for the last time. Just try to go with someone you you haven't been, if it's possible still. Yeah. Okay, so you have tacos? Yeah. Before we okay. Great. Now, uh, we'll do exercise. I, I warn you, and before, it's a little mindfuck. So, <laughs> be prepared. And it goes like this. Uh, it's called, uh, have you heard of? And one of you is in the role of the person who wants to tell uh, the, the other person about something that happened. And I start like this. Hey, hey, Hanka, have you heard of? And Hanka will again interrupt me and, and uh, say something. Hanka, have you heard of? Yeah, about a time we had a terrible hangover. No, 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 that's not what I mean. <laughs> I reject it and, and start over. I mean, the, the, the other thing, I mean... Yeah, the time we went to the zoo and saw the big monkey. No, that's not what I mean. I, I mean the, 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 the last thing, I mean the... Yeah, I know, when we went for the ice cream and then we met the big monkey who just escaped the zoo and then we had a really terrible hangover after that night. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and the way we are going to do it, uh, one person is, is saying like, have you heard of and three times, the other person gives him something else, and the, the, the first person then has to connect all the three different things to, to a story. So in this, in this example, I will be the one who connecting the stories. Okay? So Hanka will tell me one more and I will then say yeah. all, all the three. You'll just change your roles after you try yeah. it. So one more the connecting of stories was We'll we'll show it once more, okay? I'm saying have you heard that I'm connecting with stories, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I am connecting with stories. So I messed it up. Yes, you did. <laughs> so first time. So hey hey Hanka, have you heard of um... Yeah, the time we went to zoo and saw the monkey. No 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 no, that's not what I mean. I mean the other thing. The... Yeah, when we went to see your mom and she... No 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 no, I'm, I mean I mean uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> the time we uh, saw your best friend. Yes, yes, yes. The time we saw my best friend at my mother's uh, on the way to the zoo. Yeah. Okay, so I'm writing. Yeah. Sorry. So you were like put all three. Yeah, all three together and make, make it one story. So <laughs> three totally unrelated things and we'll make it one story. Okay. Let's, let's go for it. One person, the other one connects and then switch. Uh,
you up after so many lectures. <laughs> Thank you. 
ったけどさ、どうやって考えてאני חייב לשאול את השאלה הזו, אז אתה מרצה? כן. I think it was a um, really long technical presentation for 40 minutes. I know. <coughs> so, and I guess my problem. I think that you, you wanted to cover so many topics. I knew I wasn't going to finish it. So that's why I had all the notes there so people go. But yeah, I talk too quick. I know that I get into a few too enthusiastic. That's why I, I reduced my talk for um, to half. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. Um, I, I've been playing around with how I do my talks the last few times to try and adjust myself to what what works for me and trying to not be so much. In
Hello, good morning, afternoon. Uh, it's about time, probably people will start coming in. Doesn't matter. Uh, uh, today we are going to, sh I'm going to show you how some of the deployment patterns that you can use in a container application platform. That means OpenShift. Okay, this is the OpenShift track. We are talking the whole day in this room about OpenShift. And the first thing, I'm Jorge Morales from Spain. I work as a developer advocate in the OpenShift team. I usually, I do some other things in, in the team. And now my team is coming in just to watch me because they think this is going to be interesting for them, which is not, but anyway. Uh, first thing, <coughs> because this is, this is an OpenShift talk, the most important thing is to set the expectations for the talk. That means that if you know about OpenShift already, then it's fine. If you don't know anything about OpenShift, probably I will be talking about concepts, OpenShift concepts, that will be boring to, uh, to you because I'm not going to do an introduction into OpenShift. So this is the time for you if you want to live. If you stay, just stick to the end. Okay. Some of the concepts. In OpenShift, what we do is deploy applications. Usually they are deployed deploy in uh, something called pods, which creates a unit of um, your application and provides with an with a IP and um, resources, uh, uh, storage, and everything that a containers provide. That means that a pod is a one container or a set of containers shipped as a single unit, and that's a Kubernetes concept. Everything that's in blue in this in this slide, it's what Kubernetes provides to OpenShift um, product, and everything else is what we build on top of Kubernetes. When you deploy your pods, you need to access those pods. Why? Because at the end, you want to deploy one or multiple instances of your application. To be able to access all those instances of your application, there is one thing called a service that is a single point of access to your application and will abstract you from where the application is running. When you want to access those applications from the external, you will use a route. That means that you provide with a DNS name to access to your for accessing your application, and through the services it will get into the pod every request as a client. We're using an internal SDN for abstracting the networking for the pod so that pods uh, can come and go in different hosts and it will, be, um, it will be transparent for you. And then there is the replication controllers. There is a different set of controllers, but I'm gonna talk about uh, repli replication controllers that provides you with a definition of what will be your application, what will be running inside your container. This is the container or set of containers that will be running or that will be part of your application. On top of that, OpenShift provides the concept of a deployment configuration that wraps a replication controller providing you with the number of instances of your application that you want to run. Probably you want to make it uh, reliable or, or scale it and also provides with additional information like um, uh, triggers, what will make your application change from one version to another. So if something is triggered to that deployment configuration, a new version of your application will get deployed. This is really important because we are going to be talking about the deployment patterns. So the, the most important thing that we are going to talk, it's about things that can be done with deployment configurations. There is also uh, bound to the deployment configuration one concept that is the strategy that we'll use for moving your application from one version to the next one. Okay? And then the rest you can just skip it. Deployment patterns. You first, first thing you probably need to know is how do I deploy my stateless application? What is a stateless application? A stateless application is something that doesn't need to have some state. That means that I don't require to persist anything to disk because if it fails, I can just spin up a new instance of my application and it will run the same way as it had before. So a good example is a web application. I have my web application that I can just deploy into OpenShift. So for that, this is, this is a diagram that I will use for the whole talk, which try to model 
uh, an environment, an open shift environment, a hosting environment, where you have multiple nodes where your application will be running. And I will be showing how it will behave when a node fails, what it will happen with your application, or how, how would you move from one version to the application to the next one, and what things you have to do or you have to change in order for that to happen. Then we have different, different uh, parts in this diagram that are in green. I'm sorry because there is a lot of light and probably you cannot see the, the diagram very well. But you'll see that um, these green parts, they will have some meaning, some mini, but it's mostly related to what I just explained. The service layer, that means what part, how will I access my applications, yeah. if I need to create a service for my application. Then the routing layer, if I want to provide or expose my application to external consumption. And then there is the persistence layer, so if I need to have a persistent service or a stateful service, which we'll be uh, looking at in a moment. I'm just going to yeah. try get Okay. Them. I think you have to press for a while. Um, if the persistent layer, where we will be storing our data in case we have uh, stateful services. And also a registry, because we are in, our containers will be Docker containers. Every time we create an application, it will be storing the registry. And OpenShift will get that image from the registry and deploy it into your environment. Okay, so the first thing you, you need to do for a stateless application is create a new deployment configuration, same the amount of replicas of, or instances of your application that you want to have. In, the case, in this example, I'm using three. And I'm deploying just a web application. So it will deploy three instances. My, my replication controller, this is a controller that, that lives in the, in the master uh, server. It will just make sure that you have three instances of your application up and running. Then we create a service to abstract where those instances are living. Why? Because this can, these nodes for you are unknown where they are living. They can move from one node to, one, to another in case of failure. So we create an abstraction layer. So in case we want to access our application, you don't do it directly to the instance, to a concrete instance, but you go through an abstraction layer. And then you have also a routing layer. So in case you create a web application, you want consumers to go to your web application. So you provide with a DNS name, like web.example.com, and it will just be accessible through the normal, uh, from a normal uh, web client to consume your application. What happens? Oh. Yes, that's a stateless application. We'll see failover afterwards. State, stateful applications is an application that requires persistence somewhere. Why? Because if my application goes down and then I start a new instance of my application, I need the data that was in there to still be there accessible to my application. How do we model this in, in, in OpenShift? I am using an example where we have a web application, but this application, it's using a database okay, for, for deploying, for storing this uh, uh, data. So at the end, what I will have is two different types of, uh, of um, set of applications. I will have my web application and I will have my, my database. The first thing to do is if I need to persist my data in an external persistent storage, I need to create a persistence volume to provide with where or, or the, the, the configuration for the amount of data, where it will be lived, whether it's external, an, F, an NFS server, Cinder, Cluster, Save, whatever type of storage you have available in your installation. Once you have your persistence volume, you create your database using that persistence volume. So you create a deployment configuration, the amount of instances that you want. You want a highly available database. So you have now two instances of a highly available MySQL up and running and using a shared storage. That means that you can fail over from one instance to the other seamlessly. So if one node goes down, you will still have your database up and running. To access that, Database, you will always require a service to abstract you from how do I access my database. Why? Because, as I say, database or, or pods can come and go. If something fails, it will just spin up a new pod in somewhere. And then, because I'm going to access my database not from a client, but from a web application, what I do is create my web application and link it to the service. So I will link my web application to my database. How? Through 
this is done through environment variables. So my, my web application will have some configuration, username, password, whatever configuration. I mean, my web application in my Tomcat, I will set some configuration to access that uh, database. So I will set these uh, credentials and I will point it to the service. So my web applications will go to the service through the, this service abstraction layer. That means that my web application will be able to connect as long as I have one of the instances of my application up and running. To expose this, again, for external consumption, because we are talking about applications that we want to make accessible, you need a service and you need a route. Okay? When we are talking about stateful applications and we are talking about an immutable infrastructure, one of the biggest problems that we face is how do I create my database? How do I, do I load the initial set of data that I want in my database? We want to have a set of reusable images, my SQL, whatever, that will be the same. At the end, it's the runtime. But it will be different for, for each and every user that uses this, that runtime. Every application will require their own schema. So one thing that you need to do is to, once you have your application, create that schema on top of the application. How can we do it? So we can preload the data. That means that I can create an image that it will be only suitable for my application. If I have a different type of application, because that database has certain schema, I will have to create a different database with a different schema. A different, when I'm talking about different database, I'm talking about a different Docker image. Or you can have that data, that schema creation, offloaded into an external persistence volume. That means that I, I have to guarantee that some way I will create the schema, the data files in the persistence volume, and the database just will connect to that uh, data files in that volume. You can also use something that's called post-deployment hook. That means that every time you have to ship with your database container one script, once the database image, which is generic, it's been, is deployed, it will run a script that will, will do something, in this case, create the schema. At the end, it has one drawback, which is that this image, that this um, database image, will have to have the script also in the, data, in the, in the image itself. So at the end, even, even if the, the image is reusable or you can have multiple, multiple scripts, the script has to be embedded into the image. There is a different pattern, there is a different controller that we are shipping right now in OpenShift, it's coming from Kubernetes, that is called a job. A job, it's, it's uh, something that you can run once to the end, one instance up to the end. So I can just create um, one job that it will have the responsibility of creating or populating, creating that schema for you. So I have my deployment, my application up and running without a schema. I can run a separate process of the job that it will run, create the schema, and die. The good thing is that you are not binding in any, in any way the schema to the database. So that this makes a more reusable process of configuring your databases or loading your databases. Or you can have it, or of course, application loaded. That means that there is different, there is different types of application frameworks like Hibernate or uh, different type of languages like Perl, Node.js, that when you start your application, because this, the, the schema is in some way embed, uh, related to the application, it will just create the schema for you in the database. Okay, now that we know what different types of applications we can ship, so there is, um, there is a stateful application or a stateless application. Of course, with these patterns, we can go the full microservices type of application. The stateful, um, both of them suit very well for, for microservices. They also fit very well for legacy type of, of, of applications. The, the only constraint with the legacy type of applications right now with OpenShift is that you will have to stick these applications to certain nodes. That means that we currently don't have the ability to stateful or legacy applications to orchestrate them so they can move. The applications, legacy applications, even if they are not cloud ready, 
they can write in OpenShift. What we are working is into making also your applications, which are legacy and which are not cloud ready, to be able to move and be cloud ready by the platform. This is something that will come during the year through uh, something that in, in one of the talks uh, it was mentioned, it's called pet sets. Deployment strategies. <coughs> How do I deploy or update one application from one version to a, to a different version? Once I have my application, usually this is, this is uh, there is different cut types or ways of updating your application, whether you are working in development or you are working in production. Usually you will not update the same way in different environments because you want to keep in, in production or in, the, in testing, you want to preserve database data. In, the, in, in development, maybe you don't want to preserve the database data because you are developing. You can just uh, wipe out the database and create a new database from scratch. So with deployment strategies, with the deployment configuration, there is, there is a, the, you instruct, whenever you deploy something into OpenShift, you instruct how it will move transition from one version to the other. The good thing about deployment configuration, about your applications, is because your application will be running in a container, which is immutable. Once you have created the container, it will be like that, and it's the one that you will be moving from environment to environment. The only thing that requires for you to go from one version to the next one or roll back is just spin up the oldest version of your container. You, all, you already have it in your registry, so it's just a matter of going, moving back and forth. So the plumbing configuration at the end, it's the different versions, it will cycle your application. If I do a deployment and something happens, I can roll back to the previous deployment. And in fact, the platform will roll back for you if something fails. So we have different types of strategy out of the box. We have the recreate strategy, which is really easy. I just throw out whatever I have and deploy it again. Okay, that's as easy as wiping out the previous version and then uh, wiping in. Sorry by the colors because there is no too much light. I have a new a three new instances of the new version of the application. This is recreate. This is usually used more in development. Why? Because yeah. So the old containers will be stopped, uh, deleted, and then uh, new containers will be created. Yes. From the yes. Finish yes. So because at the end, what, when you create a new version of your application, you'll have a new version of an image. So let's say you create an image, version one, and an image, version two. Moving from one version to the next one is just kill the old containers and spin up a new version of the containers. Going back is as easy as killing those containers the version 2 and bringing up the version 1 containers. Why? Because you still have them there. You have all the configuration that was required. And of course, in this type of pattern, you are not caring about database. You have to, the only thing that you need to take care in OpenShift is when you are moving applications with the data. For the application itself, it's really easy. When you are moving database from version to the next version, then it's more complex because you have to think that if I go forth, then if I roll over, how will I roll over that database once I have upgraded that database? So you have to take care a lot when you are following these patterns for database stateful services or this type of deployments. We are working a lot into providing capabilities for allowing database to be also easily transitioned from one version to another, and they will eventually come with the platform but of course that's something that it takes a lot of time. You have to look at all the different patterns. Rolling deployment, canary releases. We do a deployment, we move from one application, application one to application two in a rolling fashion. That means that a set amount, we, we put a new amount of the new version two, we take out a, a certain amount of version one. That means that we will not lose our service at any point, we will be our application will be up and running and will be accessible at all the time. Of course, your application needs to be compatible. That means that during the time that your application moves from transitions from one version to the other, if the if the application if the database schema is different, you will have to look into that how to move that. So this is the example is really used or or I'm showing. It's for a stateless, uh, stateless type of application transitioning. 
Good thing is that we are doing canaries. Mm. What is a canary release? A canary release is when you want to move one application to a new version of the application, but doing gradually, and in that time that you do the rollover of the new plat of the new version, you want to look at what's happening. So if something doesn't go well, roll back. But not the whole application. Maybe you want to do one by one, check that everything works fine, you need the ops guys to look into something, and it takes time. So that's why the rolling strategy has more configuration than the, uh, than the previous one, redeployment. Redeployment, just drop the old, bring the new. Rolling over, how will I ro do the rolling? Okay, so I can struct what will be the update period of my application from, to move. So uh, the, in this example, I'm moving the, the previous one to the next one in iterations, in the slots, and it's happening every day. That means that the new version or a new containers of the new version will come. I will have one day to check if everything goes fine. And if everything goes fine and I don't stop or cancel the deployment, it will continue to move. And then, of course, if, if it fails uh, on the redeployment, it will roll back automatically. But this is when you are doing Canary, you want to, if you put a long update period of uh, seconds, what you want to do is have your ops looking into the behavior of the application. And then there is the max search and max available that instructs which will be the chunks of um, application that I can exceed from the, from, of the new version and that I can live without of the old version. That means that the amount of pods that it will be bring over before tearing down the old version. You can specify it in percentage or you can specify it in, 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 in amount. So that means that you can say, okay, do it one by one, do it, uh, if I have 100 of applications, just move 25% of the applications, create a new version. It's really, it's better to see it with an example. This is one by one. So what I do is create a new instance of my new version, and then once I, I check, it will all delete the old one. New one, delete the old one. A new one, and delete the old one. I'm moving, in this example, I'm only transitioning the stateless part of my application. I'm assuming that the web application it will work the same with the database. When, if you want to talk about, I'm not showing in this talk because it's a very short talk, or probably, um, I'm not showing about transitioning databases, but if you want to talk about that, that pattern, or if you have, uh, want to know how we can propose it, just come and ask me after the talk. Blue-green deployments. Does anybody know what is a blue-green deployment? What is for? I'm, I have to ask. Okay. Uh, what? Yeah, it's uh, you have uh, you are running two instances of your uh, application. Yes. One is live, and the other one is your testing environment. And we go to switch. They are called blue because the blue is running, or the green is running, and the blue is not running. And then one goes to switch to the other one. You switch, it goes live, and then you have the other one testing. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 It's it's not only meant for testing. With uh, of course, it can be used for testing, and there is one pattern that is more <coughs> used for usually for testing, which we'll, we'll, we will see later. It's also to be able to provide some guarantees or some predictability of that the new version of the software is good. That means that I will have at cer a certain point both of the applications, the blue and the green. That means the version one and version two of the applications live. And I will be able to switch really fast between both applications. So I will deploy the new application. Once, once the application is deployed, I will switch to the new version of the application. If something goes wrong, it's just a matter of <coughs> changing the routing or how I will access my application. And it will be a matter of seconds going back to the previous version. While if you, do a, um, if you have to do deployment, it will take the time to deploy your application, your new version of the application, to transition from one to the other. Okay? Of course, it doesn't work in, some, in certain scenarios, so it's not suitable for every scenario. So if you want to access the same database, it has to be compatible. You need, you need to know that both of the applications will be accessing the database. That's, so th there is certain considerations that you need to look at when you are doing AD. AD. How do we implement AB? 
we have a deployment configuration of three instances of my application, which is version one, it is the blue, and I have a service abstracting that, uh, the access to this blue application and a route, because I have consumers of my application accessing the clients of my application accessing them. What I do is just create a new instance, version two, which will consist again of a deployment configuration and a service. And once I have both instances of my application with the abstraction, with the service abstraction layer being able to access my application, what I do is just change my routing. So my routing before was pointing to the service, my application blue, and now it's pointing to my application green. That's a matter of one single command that it will change your routing and it will be instantly. If Whenever you do blue-green deployment, if something goes fine, you will maintain the green. But if something goes wrong, you will maintain the blue, and you will, you will be able just to remove the green deployment and just create a new version and ship it whenever you are ready for it. Next pattern, A-B testing. So I have one question regarding the rolling. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to the rolling, so it's in the service layer. So it's, it's, it's during the rolling, it's still on the old uh, containers? It's working on the old one? Or and if everything is okay, then we switch? During, during the rollover? Yeah, uh, if you go to the rolling. Okay. And here, yeah. because it's, it's rolling, it takes time, right? Yes. So when on the service layer is switched? Yeah. So you have a one application, you have a just going to another, another one. So on the user level, you have a web service. When the user server the yeah. Yeah. If you do it by default with one service, what it will happen is that your application will be accessing your new version. No, oh, sorry, your old version, okay? Usually, and when you want to do long, ro ro uh, long rolling deployment of your application, you mix this pattern with AB or with, with uh, AB testing that I'm, I was going to show. So you create a new service to access your, your new version of your application so you can test it if it's a long rollover. If it's a short rollover, what it will happen is that it will create a new instance, it will just move the deployment of your instance and your, the service it will be accessing both of them at the same time. So that depending on the time on the, on the, and on the uh, differences on the application, you will have to follow different patterns. You have usually, usually A-B testing and blue-green needs to be mixed with the configuration for the rolling deployment. A-B testing, who knows who is A-B testing? And by the way, you ask a question. So feel free, oh sorry, feel free to ask questions. You get, what? I, somebody asked a question before, you did? Okay. Otherwise, I will have to take them home. <laughs> okay, uh, who knows what is A-B testing? What's the purpose of A-B testing? Go ahead. So we have uh, two versions of applications, of, uh, of an application, and we serve one version to one subset of users, and the second one to second subset of users, and we test which one is better for users. Or yeah, well, really, really the main purpose is not to test which one is better for users, but what you usually do is, the B version, what you want to do is to, to get some uh, information about a new version <coughs> that you are developing, so you will get some sample data about the behavior, and usually A-B testing follows back with going back to A once you're finished. So you, you get to B, you, or you, you deploy a new version of your new application, you direct a certain amount of users to the new version, you, they start using that new version of the application and you check what's the behavior or you ask them because you know who's, who will be using this new version of the application. Once you know and you get all the information that you wanted, you can roll back and if, if that, uh, or, or if the application goes fine, then do a rolling deployment or a deployment to the B version and just deploy it for everybody. So every testing is a way of testing features in a, in a controlled way. So you, you usually 
want to you want to direct this testing of the features to a certain amount of users. So we have right now we have the ability of doing A/B testing on uh, out of the box and in OpenShift, but we are working on providing with more advanced use cases for A/B testing. So we start with mm -hmm. application A, three instances, service A, AB, and the route. So the main difference with this is that I have my application, I have a label that is called AB member. You can call it whatever, but I have a label for this type of services. And my service will route to all the pods that are using that label. Okay, services related to pods through a level selector. That means that it will go to all the pods that has that level. What do I do? Is I deploy a new version of my application. One, one instance, that means that right now I will have three pods of the old version and one pod of the new version. If I do the normal balancing on the routing uh, layer, I will get 25% of sampling data out of this. Then what I and you can scale of course depending on the amount of on the amount of sampling data that you want. If you want 50%, you just scale up the new version of the application to provide you with the percentage of the uh, sampling data that you want. And you do all the testings, all the testing that you require. Once you've done all the testing, you go back to the to the previous release and you decide whether you want to go live with the new version or not. So things that we are working right now, because the A-B testing that we provide is somehow <coughs> based on the amount of pods <coughs> that you can spin up, we are working on trying to provide more advanced use cases, whether it's in the platform or through patterns that can be created on, on the application, like being able to provide weight, being able to do the routing to this new version based on headers or cookies or whatever. So. The routing layer will direct to the new version only the amount of users that have to go. So you can have just one instance of your new version and whatever amount of instances of the, of the old version, and based on the criteria, just direct the users up to that version. Right now, it's limited to all the users, so it will be unpredictable in some way. Of course, if you want to make it predictable, what you usually do is create a new version of your application, expose it into a different route, and just have the new set of users going into your application through a different route. But that's more or less like having two versions of the application, two complete sets of the application from top to bottom. Any questions so far? Don't feel shy. Otherwise, we are going to finish in five minutes. One question. Yes, please. But you have a wife. Let's say uh, you have a new version of a JavaScript yeah. uh, and a new API. Yeah. Um, so you want that user who gets that version of JavaScript, all, all those API calls, and it's going to mm -hmm. that new version. Uh, how is that handled? Yeah. So right now, right now, that's one of the that's one of the things that when you roll a new deployment, if your if your browser is caching things, and you probably uh, you get requests to different to different versions, you will probably have unpredictable behavior on the on the on the client. The routing layer usually do sticky sessions. On the, on the source IP. That means that once you, you start a session on the routing layer, it, you will always go to that, to that application. So that means that if it could happen, or, or it, it, and one session that's already been going on, it will always go to version A. If there is a new uh, user, it will go to session B, or to the version B. Once you finish with the A-B testing, you spin down or scale down that container, there will be no longer version B. The routing layer will direct you to, to the version A. And that's the time where it could uh, fail. In, when, we, when you as, a, as an admin scale down version B to the A. Otherwise, 
The routing layer usually is doing the sticky session, so it's guaranteed that once you start a session, it will go to the same to the same uh, backend. The only thing, the only consideration is that, of course, if there is NAT or there is a firewall that obstructs the so the real source IP, you will have unpredictable behavior. But you know to know you need to know your network topology in order to apply this pattern. So if you don't know how you're gonna do it, probably the best way is just to create a new version of the bit test, the bit version of your application, give a new client or give a new URL, a new route to the users you want to test B, do the B, and then once that's done, they will start using again the version B through the routing to the version or the version A through the routing to the version A. Ryan. Um, Hope it's not a question. It's it's a it's a question. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it okay? No, no, you, are, you should know everything. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a lot of stuff that I haven't seen yet, and um, in the old version of OpenShift, there was uh, something where we would auto-scale the application, and if there were persistent connections or open sockets, uh, we would not put it to sleep, or not scale it all the way down. Um, do you know if there's anything in, in the roadmap uh, to count the number of connections and maybe say, hold off on removing uh, an old deployment until the connections are are so all that's closed. A, that's right? a, what is called graceful shutdown. Ah, okay. So that's a, usually when you when you want to move, you can do it. You can do a graceful shutdown, but the graceful shutdown has to have a period. Mm. That means that you provide with a certain amount a of mass, time yeah. for the users yeah. to move away. Then after that, you cannot wait. If a, if yeah. a user is holding you from transition from one version to another, you cannot hold. So at the end, it will for those servers that hasn't transitioned in that uh, graceful shutdown period, they will fail. Yes, yes. Uh, he he. Sorry, but he uh, and raised this, his hand. This means that the current version can set state to brain in load balancer. Sorry. Uh, in in the proxy, you can set state to brain, then only sticky sessions will reach that mode. Uh, is that the future you describe now? Is there a possibility uh -huh. to, to set a state for this one container brain and say that we want to wait five minutes and we don't? Yeah, so that's, that's the thing. At the, end, at, the end, at the end, what you want to do is to provide the users certain amount. So the routing layer will not direct you in the in the in the routing layer. You will not get new requests to the new to the old version. So all the new requests will get to the old version. But you you want to transition. You want you want to be able to remove the old version from the deployment because at the end it's consuming computing resources. It's consuming. Uh, it's the pods are there and you want to eventually be able to remove them. So what you want to do is to provide them with a period of time that they will be able to move. Otherwise, you just kill them. The question is, can you do it in the current product? Yeah. Yeah. Is there some way how to move the sessions from the one instance to another? No. Or it's something like you want to implement in the application that if you have something like card, like uh, you buy something. That's like application a specific. Session. Yeah, that's application specific because at the end, at the end, card. How how do you do a card? Yeah, depends on the language. Depends on the word. Session storage. Like you, you could move yeah. the. Sessions on the yeah, but, this, this, but which sessions? Application yeah. sessions. So if you're using AP, you're using probably the, the application session storage that uses EAP. If you are using Node, whatever. If you are using, so there is no way to provide this out of the box. So you can you have to provide it in your application. Yeah. Yes. So you would use a container like like InfiniSpan or something to cache the sessions and something like that, right? Yeah, but that's application specific. How do you model you know, that? How do you model that? Yeah, yeah. It's application it's specific. Like, yeah. But it's not going to come from the platform. No, 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 never. How does that get in? Uh, is it an NMA fault that it's going to shut down? So it can Sorry, not to prepare itself or run it towards it? Uh, is there some event in the node? Some like a signal to the application? Yeah, by, yeah. is it just to. Mm. Uh, I think that's the reason why to build no. applications on the REST API, right? So you can interchange this uh, this uh, intermediate layer without an issue. You just need not to break the uh, uh, rest uh, rest uh, call in uh, in progress, and you usually need just few seconds for for. for so what, what what you do what you do the redeployment? There is there is two phases. One phase is bring up the new instance. That's not what we are discussing, and that the other is 
tear down the old instance. When you tear down the old instance, what you do is send a signal to the container and there is a period of time that you give that container to go down. The thing is that the thing is that, that period of time that you give the container depends on the container that the runtime that you are using. Let's say EAP. EAP doesn't provide with grateful shutdown in certain scenarios. So you'll get the signal and depends on the runtime that you are using to shut down properly those uh, sessions or not. But at the end you have to provide timeouts for this to happen, otherwise you are always stick to waiting and waiting and waiting forever if something doesn't transition. Okay, the last part, in that we are running out of time, I think, uh, but I see you're really interested, so I will continue until you leave. <laughs> Next, uh, last uh, thing is how would you promote application from one environment, OpenShift environment, to a different environment. OpenShift provides you different ways of modeling your environment. That means that usually if you have one single OpenShift cluster, what you will do is level your environment with different tags, with different levels, saying these certain nodes will be target for development, this amount of nodes will be target for the uh, test, this amount of nodes will be target for production. So whenever you deploy an application, it will, if it's a testing application, it will get deployed to the nodes for application. If it's a, a production application, it will get, go to the production type of servers, maybe because the quality of service that you provide in those servers are better, maybe because, uh, because there is more computing resources, whatever reason you have, that's up to you. So how do you move one application using one single OpenShift uh, install cluster? Okay, this is one single cluster. The first thing is when you build your application, it will be stored in the registry under one, uh, under one tag, that's the image string tag, or that's the, the name of the Docker image that you provide in the Docker registry. Okay, in this example, I'm using my application there, and I have different types of deployment configuration related to different tags. So I have, for my production environment, I have, I'm watching an image to be deployed that is called my application production. In my pre-production, I'm watching for a tag that is called um, my application pre-production, and in depth, the same. So when I, the first time that I build, I will just create the, uh, uh, the image in the registry with them, so automatically it will get deployed into the development environment with one instance because my deployment configuration just had one instance. How do I promote now? Because my developers are fine, they want the testers to test it. How do I do it? I tag my image in the registry with the new tag that is being used mm -hmm. with the new um, with the new deployment uh, with the new deployment configuration. So that means that once I tag my application with pre-production, the deployment configuration that was set for pre-production, it will deploy it. And that's the same pattern again and again for production environments. So that's how you move. Tagging into the same registry, different tags will be the source for different deployments. What about uh, different, different clusters? So I have two different installations. Usually production is different installations where I, where I don't have access. So I can follow probably in pre and pro, it's the same environment, I can follow that pattern, but maybe when I want to move into production, I need to move an image from one registry to a different registry because it's a different cluster. How do I do that? It's the same, you have one installation, one image in the registry, but this time it's not tagged especially. You don't have to tag it especially. Why? Because what you need to do, you have two deployment configuration for each and every environment. What you need to do is just move your image from one registry to the other registry. How? You pull the image, you copy probably in a pen drive, you go to the production environment and load it into a registry. Once it's in the registry, it will get deployed. We are working in making that easier with some commands like OC import image, export image, that will provide with other capabilities other than the Docker basic. It will create the, all the OpenShift required stuff. And I think that was it. Uh, if you uh, have questions, ask me after we finish because there is more sessions coming in. Thank you. That was really good. You like it? Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, the thing is that when you move applications, you need to think of the database.